you are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Well, good morning. Why are you laughing? It's been a bit hazy recently, has it not? And I've been suffering, and so uh, today I thought that I would preach with my mask on. Would that be okay? No, there's been a lot of reasons why we've had to wear masks lately, has there not? And uh, we need to be praying for each other as we struggle through this, this very thing. Today, I uh, have titled our, our sermon, Removing the Mask of Religion. And we're going to do that here in just a moment. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 1 to 23 here today, and really it's a continuation of what Mark has been writing in chapter 6, where he has been showing us how Jesus trained the 12 disciples how to be a follower of him that makes new followers of him. He's been teaching them how it is that he has instructed them to to make disciples, and, and he's showing them how to do that. And he's, he said from the very beginning, you're going to need to depend upon me completely, But that's okay because I'm the true shepherd, not just the true shepherd, but I'm the true shepherd who is with you, who's with you in presence, no matter how difficult things may be, in this task of completing the mission, the great commission of Jesus to make disciples of all nations. Mark has recorded this, and I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit, because it's lessons that God wants you and I to know and understand. He wants you to know that if you're a follower of him, that you have a task, you have a mission, you have a purpose until he calls you home, and that is that you are to make disciples of all nations. And nobody here is excluded. If you're already a follower of Jesus Christ, you have this command given to you. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you need to know that this is part of the deal. It's not just like, hey, come to Jesus and you get to do life however you want to. It's come to Jesus, he's going to call you to some purpose and to some things, which includes making disciples of other people. But don't worry, depend on me. I'm the true shepherd, I'm with you. All of these lessons we've learned, and now I would suggest we're getting to the highest level of learning. Notice the title, uh, DM401. I've kind of put this into academic language. We had lesson 101. And then 201 and 301 last week. And today, it's like the highest level of class that you can receive at a university. It's, it's 401. It's, it's the high level class that we're going to be taking here today. And, and so I want to introduce to you as part of this, uh, uh, somebody who is coming to hear about this, coming to our church. And I, I want you to just think a little bit about whether or not you would want this kind of person as a part of our membership, our body of Christ here at Harvest KL. Here's the prospective church member. He's going to attend every service, including special events. He's going to go on missions trips with a passion to convert those who don't know Christ. He's going to tithe, sing in the worship team, read his Bible daily, and memorize Scripture. What do you think? Should we let him in? He will be happy to pray in corporate worship. He is thoroughly orthodox in his theology. He's an an erratist that believes in heaven and hell. He never gets drunk. He's not addicted to porn, never uses profanity. He's a family man who loves his country, weeps on Independence Day, National Day, and votes in the way that you and I would expect. Should we let him in? His reputation in our community is fantastic. It's stellar. If any man ever earned a right to go to heaven, it's this man. His religion is something amazing to admire. Sadly, this man is headed for hell. I've just introduced you to a 21st century Pharisee. A Pharisee in the first century was not scorned and pushed away as a legalist. He was looked on as a modern citizen and a person of piety and religion. 
Unfortunately, Pharisees had, as Paul said, a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Amazingly, we can have a passion for God, but not really know Him. We can be deceived and captured and enslaved by the deadly lure of legalism and religion. Tragically, those who have been raised in the church are most susceptible for this kind of deception. Our pride in our religious rituals, church practices, and cultural traditions blind us to both our great sinfulness and our great need of a Savior who alone can rescue us from our sin. Today, I want you to see a very important statement that we'll then talk around as we look at the Word of God. You can write this down as it's our driving statement today. It's this. Jesus calls us to trust in His perfect work on our behalf, not in our own external righteousness. What we're going to find here today as we read God's Word is that rules and religion are inadequate. That it's going to be only the work of Jesus Christ that will actually make us have a right relationship with God and bring us into right standing. So let's read Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23 here this morning. Read along with me as I, as I read it aloud for you now. Mark writes this in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Then Mark makes a statement, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their their heart is far from me. In vain they they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men." You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you have gained from me is korban, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for the father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then, are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. We've been learning here who the real Jesus actually is. That's really the theme of this whole teaching series, trying to see Jesus in the completeness of who he is. And to do that, we oftentimes have to rub away some of the dust and some of the the haze that is on top of our image of who Jesus is that, that oftentimes is coming right from our own hearts, our own thoughts. Jesus here begins to wipe away and clarify something that had deceived and tricked many people in the day that he was living on earth. And I believe still is very deceptive 
not just in the world, but in our churches even today. So we kind of leave off from last week the summary statement of what Jesus was doing, and I would just kind of redirect you to that. And and what we see here is that Jesus, uh, after he had done this amazing miracle on on the boat with the the disciples, they they come to the land and everybody recognizes who he is, and they're all reaching out for him, and they're all trying to cling to his robe, and, and they're bringing all the sick to public places, to the marketplace in particular. If you were to look at chapter 6, verse 56, it would say that they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might, they might touch even the fringe of his gar- barment, garment, and many as touched it were all made well. Jesus has just come from this place where he was publicly surrounded by all sorts of different people and were being touched by them and, and they were healing, kind of like the woman with the blood issue a couple chapters earlier, right? And when they touched him, they were, they were healing him. But but when they were touched in the mark, when he was touched in the marketplace by all of these people, some of whom may not have been Jewish but actually Gentiles, it began to create this conflict within the religious people of the day, where they were like, "Wait a second, Jesus, you're 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 doing all sorts of things. You're you're healing dead people and touching their bodies, and you're you're, you're forgiving people, and and they're, you're letting them touch you. You're you're getting ceremonially unclean." So we pick up the story in, chat, in verse 1 here, and it says the Pharisees gathered to him. You remember who the Pharisees were, right? They're, they're like the super religious people. They're the rule followers of the day. Many of them were rather middle class, but they were really all classes. And, and they were the ones who kind of had control of society by all the different rules of their particular religion in the day. It was an Old Testament religion, if you will. Uh, 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 one that wasn't really what the Old Testament teaches, but had spun off from that. They were super good at keeping the rules. It says the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is about 150 kilometers away. Think of it like if we were to take a trip up from Malacca here to Kuala Lumpur. They'd come from that distance. And these guys were the guys who really had it together. They were educated and they were often considered lawyers in that they would expound what the Word of God said and how to live it out for the people. And so they were consulted about what to do and what not to do many times. And, and they came and they confront Jesus by attacking his disciples because they remember what happened before. In in chapters 2 and 3, we saw the controversies with these same religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, and how uh, Jesus bested them at every moment. So much so, they got so frustrated, they joined with people of the opposite political party to try to kill him, to try to find a way to get rid of him. Now we see they've come back, they realize we can't actually make a frontal attack on Jesus, so we're going to come around the end and we're going to attack his disciples. We're going to deal with this issue of purity. Now, purity was a big deal for the Old Testament believers. Purity was, uh, was really how they would set themselves apart and show that they were different from the rest of the world. Uh, when we see the command in Peter that we are supposed to be holy because God is holy, we recognize we can't be the way people who are unholy act and lived, and, and they understood that, and so they had all sorts of rules about how to be clean, how to be pure, and one of their rules was in this washing of hands. And so they attack their disciples, it says, look at verse 2, they saw that some of the disciples ate with the hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Now, now it's interesting they use this word defiled here because we realize it's not about hygiene or sanitation. It's not that they had dirty hands or that there were germs that are involved. The issue is defiled. They They were not obeying the rules of which Mark gives us some understanding about what that was like because he's writing in Rome, remember? He, he's in Rome, hearing from Peter, writing things down, and, and to mostly a Gentile audience who didn't follow the, the rules of purity according to Judaism. And so they didn't know what those rules were, so he inserts an editorial comment in verses 3 and 4 and helps us understand what that means. And look what he says, The Pharisees and the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly not just wash their hands, there is a way that they prescribe that we do this, holding to the tradition of the elders. In other words, whatever that properly was, that that was something that had come that had been come up by religious leaders previous to them who had who had given an oral tradition about how to do it. 
You know, make sure you use the soap and it goes all the way up to your elbows. Or, or I, we don't know exactly what it was. We just know that there was a proper way to do those things. And the disciples were not doing whatever was proper in that. It says here, as we continue, and, and there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. In other words, all of these ways that they were supposed to remain pure and clean in practical everyday things. You see, they recognize that having a relationship with God isn't something that you just say and then it doesn't affect how you live. They recognize that if we're going to have a relationship with God, it actually impacts my everyday decisions and how we go about doing things. And they saw that the disciples weren't doing things according to... According to who? According to God's Word? No. According to the traditions of the elders. See, this is where the problem is going to come. This tradition of the elders. They were not holding to this tradition. And the many traditions that they had, really what we see here is if we were to read the Old Testament, when God gave the laws for how Israel was supposed to separate themselves and show themselves distinct from the rest of the world so that the rest of the world would ask about God and, and see who He is. That was the purpose, one of the purposes. And so God had given a written word, right? We know them as the Ten Commandments, right? But were there only ten rules? Now, you've read your Bible, right? You know, you're reading Deuteronomy. There's, not ten, like, there's all sorts of rules. Do you know how many rules there actually is written down in the Old Testament in the law, as they call it? 613. So they had 613 rules which were supposed to guide them so that they would be set apart as God's holy people. And, and, and yet, what they found was that wasn't enough. The, the, the people of the day realized we have these 613 rules, but we have to do something to make sure that we don't accidentally live this out or, or, or trip over these things. And so we have to give some commentary about how to do this. You see, the rules tell us what to do, but they don't tell us how to actually go about it. And so there was some really good accountant, lawyer, detailed type of person who got down and they started writing some things about how to make sure you don't break the 613 rules. They began this oral tradition that they called the fence around the rules. And the fences, fences are important, right? They, they, keep you, they keep you from getting into where you're not supposed to, right? And then kind of like a guardrail on the side of the road. They keep you going from where you're going to be danger in danger from, right? And so this idea of we got to build this fence around the rules of God uh, began, began, to be, began, began, to be, began to be very popular, And these rules were things that were adding to what God had already told them to do. They were a burden to people because there wasn't just 613. There was, like, I can't even keep the 10, you know? And then there's 613, and then what? I get, I get thousands of rules after that? That's what they were doing. And in this, they were speaking where Scripture was silent. They were adding to the Word of God and saying, listen, our little fence rules are just as important as God's rules. Does that sound like a good plan to you? It's not. We're not God. We don't have the ability to make rules for God. That's actually a pretty bad plan, but... But for some of us, that's kind of comforting to, to, to know I'm not going to break the rule because I'm not keeping the fence rule, right? That, that's kind of helpful sometimes. And we begin to, begin to think about that. And, and here's the reality. that Walking in grace of the gray is really hard. If you're actually concerned about being holy like God is holy, it's kind of hard to walk in the grace of the gray. I mean, wouldn't you rather have some black and white this, not this, this, not this. Things that could kind of keep us into order. Look at verse 5. The Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, he gives an answer, Let me just say this. I think this is important at this moment. 
Notice it says, why are they not living according to the tradition of the elders? There is nowhere that God ever gives a command in Scripture that tells us to wash our hands before we eat, or how. So let's just get that out of the way. I went and I looked. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that. And so they're making this accusation, and... Unfortunately, I think I identify with them more than I do the ones being accused. Have you ever been in the grocery store and, and, and you walked in and somebody's kid is just not happy to be there? You know where I'm going with this, right? Not only are they not happy to be there, they're telling everybody in the store at the top of their lungs that they're not happy to be there, right? And, and it's super easy for me to be able to be like, why, why can't you control your kid, right? Right? We've all done that. And that's why we all feel embarrassed and all motivated to, to make our kid to stop crying because we, we, we know what it like, it's like to be the person saying, why can't you make your kid stop crying, right? So then I'm trying to make my kid not cry. And guess what it does? It just makes my kid cry harder, right? And, and, and in the middle of this, this accusation that just has no context for what's going on with that particular kid is made. Do you have, pres- pre- have any preferences that become prescriptions? Things that you would prefer that become like, this should be law. No, no parent should be allowed in the grocery store if they can't control their kid. Law. I mean, we laugh, but we, we tend to have these kinds of traditions of the elders. We tend to have things that we have expectations and, and rules and ways of doing things. We, we tend to have things that, uh, when we stop to think about it, doesn't really make sense. But, man, we really stick by these rules sometimes. I come from a family that is blessed by a Christian heritage, but maybe not so much as you think, because some of my heritage is very, very legalistic and religious in a pharisaical kind of way. I remember going over to some of the elderly people in in my family, and uh, we were not allowed to play cards. If the cards had the hearts and the spades and the diamonds on it, you weren't allowed to play that game. You know why? Because it was a fence, so that you don't learn how to play the games that actually make you gamble money later, right? And yet, I always wondered, why is it we're allowed to play with the games with the dice? Like, like I, it just doesn't make sense when you start to think about it, right? And I think what happens is we start thinking that Jesus is super proud of us. Wow, you've built a fence. You don't play cards. Wow, Jesus, you're going to be okay with me today. I'm a good boy. But look at, what he said. Well, look at what he says. He said to them, verse 6, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it's written? It's sarcasm there. You know, the Bible has humor in it, right? This is, this is, this is like Jesus saying, great job, guys. <laughs> and, you, and it's like, no, he's not saying great job at all, right? That, that's what's being said right here. And he responds, and he says, here, write this down before we get to it. Surprise, religion is a mask covering false worship. When you're all about the rules that you make and the fence that you have and that religious thing that you're doing, it really, it is masking and covering over false worship. That's what Jesus says here. Look at verse 6 to 8. As Isaiah says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Jesus says to the Pharisees who asked the question, you leave the commandment of God and you hold to the tradition of men. In all of this, and up till now, Jesus, when he's been uh, come to deal with the religious leaders, he's dealt with them with questions. He's given short expressions of truth that are rather pithy, and he's sometimes warned them. But for the first time, we see a scathing denunciation of the religious leaders as he quotes from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Isaiah 29 is condemnation, it's written as condemnation for Israel's leaders and judgment against them. 
In it, Isaiah 29 says that these religious leaders who should have their act all together and look like they have their act all together are in fact blind and deaf leaders who are pursuing human tradition that God completely dismisses. That's Isaiah 29. That's where Jesus quotes from in his sarcastic remark to them. He says to them, and refers to them, these religious leaders, as hypocrites. You know what a hypocrite is? You know what it actually means? It means somebody who puts on a mask mask, so that they can perform in a dramatic experience on a stage. It's theater. He says, you guys, you guys are a bunch of play actors who are up on stage running a play. It's not reality. It's not real life. You have a mask on to disguise the role that you're playing and who you actually are on stage. Hypocrite means somebody who acts in a role without sincerity. They're pretenders. You get the idea, right? He says you have your mask on for the theater of life. And sure, everybody around you thinks you're a pretty good actor about it, but I'm seeing something different. I'm seeing behind the mask. I'm seeing what's actually there. I'm seeing that what you're doing is actually divorced from the reality of what your heart is actually saying. And in it, as you make sure the mask looks really awesome... And that surface level things where you're honoring me with your lips and you're worshiping me, but your heart is very far from me. He's saying that's false worship. Religion is a mask covering false worship. Religion is a mask that says... I'm going to do all sorts of things that other people think look really great. I'm going to do all sorts of things that I think God will be really proud of me about. But in reality, you have a heart that's far from God. You're saying, I'll, I'll play the role, but, but I don't really believe this stuff. I'll go to the church, but I won't actually act in faith in my everyday life. Hypocrites. A hypocrite who is called up in the idolatry of self. Really, every religion in the world is actually an idolatry worshiping themselves. Including if you're involved in the Christian religion. That's really what we're getting here today. It's this idolatry where we replace the divine with merely human thoughts. I mean, that's what they're doing, this tradition of the elders. We're we're going to build a fence that's so high around the actual rules of God, you don't actually see God, you just see our big fence and how important our words are in this particular matter. So humans begin to see that they're subject to the interpretation of the law instead of the law itself. And they've left the commandments of God, it says in verse 8. They've not just left the commandments of God, they're rejecting God and His ways. They're rejecting the commandments of God. And that's the problem with religion. Religion is a mask. All religions are masks. Where they replace their tradition, removing God's Word and saying, this is the way we're going to do it. And it's always, by the way, it's always, every religion in the world is the same. It's always about me doing something to get into God's good graces. It's never about God did something for me. It's always me doing something for God. But let's not focus on all the religions of the world. Today is not a religion class. Let's focus on you. So you say that you're a Christian. What is it that you're actually trusting in? The finished work of Jesus or your performance? In other words, you get up one day and you're like, I'm late. 
the alarm goes off and I hit the snooze button too many times and I get up cursing the, the whole alarm system. And then I yell at my kids on the way out the door and I rush out and don't say anything to my wife. And I get to work and I'm so upset that I'm in traffic and there's, there's everybody, everybody in traffic is stupid, but I'm perfect, right? And I get to work and, I'm, and it's super easy to be irritated with all my coworkers and to yell at them. And, and I, I get to the end of my day and I'm just like, I was terrible today. God certainly doesn't love me. So you read your Bible before you go to bed, and the next day you wake up, and the alarm goes off, and you set it early so you could read your Bible again. You read your Bible, and you're feeling good, and you hug your kids, and you kiss your wife, and you pray with her before you leave the house. You're in traffic, and somebody you know, waves the wrong finger at you, and you're like, hey, love you too, don't worry about it. And, and you get to work, and your coworkers are acting ridiculous, but you kind of pull it together for the team, and everybody's better because you got it together for everybody. You get home from work, and you're like, whew, that was a hard day, but God loves me. It's so much better, Right? And the reality is God loves you no less or no more on the good day than he did on the bad day. That's the gospel message of Jesus Christ. But the reality of how we live our lives is we get to the bad day and we're like, oh, I'm so terrible and I'm not worth it and God doesn't love me and I did all these bad things and and certainly I didn't add up to anything that God would like today. Correct. But he loves you anyway. And you get to your good day and you're like, I did some good things and, 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 and God should love me because I did some good things. You're wrong. <laughs> it's not because you did good things that God loves you. On both days, He loves you equally and the same. That's the message of the gospel. And when we begin to add to what God says and live our lives as good Christian religionists, we put on masks that say my performance and how I do today. If it was a good day, my, my wife's going to love me and my kids are going to be proud of me and God's going to think I'm awesome. And if you begin to think that way, you have fallen into religion. You have believed the deception that Satan wants you to believe that it's about what you do that saves you and brings you into right relationship with God. That's not. That's not true. We're going to continue to see it here. We need to remove the mask of religion. Maybe you want to write that down. The gospel is how I remove it. Okay? There's a great threat to the gospel of grace, and that is this legalistic, religious, rule-following I'm externally righteous. The things I do on the outside are what matter before God. Like when he sees how much of a good day I have, that's the thing that God really loves. But the reality is we cannot keep up that facade and that farce. We, we can maybe do that for a day, but on the next day we've already... Listen, your coworkers who don't know Jesus, they think you're a hypocrite if you think you live that way, Right? They, they go, wait a second, you say that you're a Christian, and on some days you act like it, on other days you don't, and you say that that's how God loves and accepts you, but we see that doesn't work. You're a hypocrite. The church is full of hypocrites. And you and I say, correct. All people are hypocrites. I appreciated a man named Rich Mullen, a guy who was an artist for a number of years, a Christian musician for a number of years. When given the accusation that the church is full of hypocrites, he says, no, we aren't full of hypocrites. We always have room for more. Because everybody's a hypocrite. Nobody adds up to the perfection that we try to present with our masks. I want to remind you today that this Christian thing is not about how good you act. It's about how good God is. It's really the scandal of the gospel. That Christ still loves you and gives himself for you and calls you righteous. Even though you're not. But he did all the work so that that label can be laid upon you. So that then you can have a completely different new identity in Christ Jesus. You're not old sinner Nate. You're now Saint Nate. 
as seen by God's eyes. Not because I'm good of anything that I've done, but because Christ's righteousness has been laid on me. I have this new identity because Christ has declared I'm righteous and I'm pure and I'm holy. Not because of how I perform or lack in performance, because it's, but because of how God sees me because of what Jesus Christ has done. And He's laid on me perfection. If we're going to remove the mask of religion, the Gospel is how we are going to do it. But the story continues, and, and, and Jesus doesn't just identify the false religion, the false worship of what's going on. He goes deeper, and He gets involved in and really a, a significant event. He says in verse 9, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish the tradition. Again, that's sarcasm. He's not complimenting them. Wow, well done. He's saying, well done, that's not how it works. Right? And so, in this sarcasm, he then gives the example. He says, for Moses said, and remember, Moses was God's agent of communicating the law to the nation of Israel. So this is God's revelation. Honor your father and mother. That's the fifth commandment. Right? And then it says in two other places, in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, um, it says, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. If you don't obey the commandment, actually you deserve death. Which is true of every commandment, right? All of sin falls short of the glory of God. We all deserve death for disobeying God's commands. But what the religious people did was, it said this, but you say, instead of somebody speaking for God, They come up with it from themselves, from within their own ideas. You say, you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is korban that is given to God, then you are no longer, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. So here's what's actually going on here. Uh, What would happen is a father would grow up and grow old and he couldn't work anymore and he had apprenticed his son and so his son takes over the business. And his son is supposed to take care. Honor your father and mother. They're supposed to take care of your father and mother. And so they should be taking care of all the financial needs of their parents in this particular society and what's going on here. That's how it's being expressed contextually at that time. And in that, there are people who had set up rules who had said, you know what? Um, That's a drain on my net worth. If I have to take care of mom and dad, they should have taken care of themselves I don't have to take care of them anymore. So we found a loophole. Whenever there's rules, there's always a loophole to the rule. Trust me, I find them all the time. It's a lot of fun. They found a loophole. And they're like, wait a second. What if we said we're going to take our whole net worth and anything that we make in the future and we promise it to God when we die? Meaning we promise it to God when we die. This is this whole thing of korban. We promise it to God when we die so nobody is allowed to touch it now because they'd be taking from God if they did. And that way we get to keep all of our stuff and my parents don't have to have any of it anymore. It was sly. It was slick. And it's absolutely wicked. But you say, you've come up with a tradition a loophole, a way to morally not complete what I have commanded of you, but ethically get away with it. And they use this loophole to make and trample God's Word. And notice what it says here at the very end, and many such things you do. This is just one example of many ways that they found these loopholes to do this. Write this down. Religion is the practice of creating a system to reject God's way so I can get my way. That's ultimately what religion is. I don't want to do it God's way, so I'm going to reject the way He says, and I'm going to write in some things to to, to benefit me, to do it my way. And, And so this... This religion becomes this rule following that we make up for our own ways. Now, there's two ways that we make up rules. There's two kinds of people, if you will, in this room. There's, there, there's some who are front door legalists. 
This is from Jerry Bridges. Jerry Bridges wrote a book, and it's super helpful in, all, in this whole understanding. And he says, listen, there's front door legalists. Those are the ones who, who they come in the front door because they, they make all the rules. They have all the rules. And if they keep their set of rules, their legalistic way of doing things, they think they're accepted by God. But then there's also backdoor legalists. And some of you are like this. You're like, I see all the rules, and I'm just going to slip in the back door by doing it my own way. Right? And in this, we, we see that Jesus is addressing both kinds of legalists in this because both kind of legalists have the same heart. It's about me, and it's self-justifying me, and it's performance so I look good at the ignorance of what God has actually told me to do. And in all of this, we are guilty, every single one of us, of this act of self-righteousness. I mean... We do these things today. When I begin to read to you the prospective member at the beginning of the message here today, you're like, wow, this guy's pretty good. Let's have him play a part of our church, right? He shows up the church. He gives the church. He serves the church. He goes to small group. But if his heart is cold to God, what did Jesus say? If his heart is cold to God, It doesn't matter what he's doing on the outside. Oh, he's religious, but he doesn't actually love God. Let me ask you, are you cold to God? Is your heart cold to the Lord? I mean, your mask looks pretty good today. You're in church. (laughs) You were singing earlier. You gave. You're going to serve later. I... You might be really religious, but don't fall into the deceit that thinks that because you've done good things and created a system where you say, that bar's high enough and I can get over it. I can can jump over that bar and look good to others that that's what matters to God. It isn't. It's your heart. And if your heart is cold to the Lord... You need to remove the mask of religion. You need to remove the mask that says, I can create some things to make myself pretty good and and make myself think that God thinks of me pretty good as well. So if your heart is cold to the Lord, you need to know this. The only way a heart warms to God is when you're gospel-saturated when you're so full of the gospel of Jesus Christ and His message of love and acceptance, not based on your performance, but on what He did at the cross, when you're so full of that, your heart will begin to warm to God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, talks about this. He says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, religious, legalist, scribes and Pharisees type of people set the bar super high. I can't ever reach how good they all are. So how do I get this kind of righteousness? The answer is Jesus. And it's the complete opposite of what you expect. Because really, legalists, religionists... They have all sorts of morals, all sorts of rule. We call it moralism. And moralism says you work to do things to get right. But Jesus says you don't have to do anything. You just believe me to be right. To which the lawyers and scribes and Pharisees are like, whoa, whoa, wait a second, that blows my mind. Like, then what? How do we keep people in control? And how do they do the things that that really love God? And and they're all going to break all the rules. But it's in the faith and belief of trusting in Jesus that the mask of religion is ripped off. It's when we realize what Jesus has done. He's forgiven you. He's freed you. He's made you right. And there's nothing that you can do to earn or merit it. It's the grace of Jesus Christ. It's the gift of God to you. 
And you're sitting there going, but I know I'm bad, and, and, I, and, and I'd be a hypocrite. And, and the answer is no, because you're, you're not doing anything. You're putting your trust and belief in the one who is perfect. You aren't perfect. And God's going to look at you, and He's going to see you as righteous, even though you're not. And that doesn't mean you're a hypocrite, because if you're in Christ, if you're in Him, that is the true reality of how God sees you. And in all of that, it is going to change the motivation of your heart. As your heart warms to God, you're, you're going to realize, I'm still not holy, but I'm striving to be. And I don't have to work to get something because I already have it. And I know that I have pharisaical tendencies in me, but He loves me as the hypocrite that I am. And it's when that transfer happens in your heart that you begin to actually live holy, not for your own benefit, not for your own pat on the back, but for the Lord who says, I accept you and I want you to be different. So we've seen religion is a mask and religion, it's really about me. We've seen that gospel is the thing that's going to remove it and that faith in Jesus Christ, in this gospel message, is how it happens. But notice one last thing here this morning. Jesus goes on in verse 14 and He tells a parable. He, he calls people to Him again and, and says to them, Hear me, all you, and understand. Because clearly you don't understand yet. Verse 15, There is nothing outside of a person that by going into Him can defile Him make him unclean, religiously, ceremonially. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. You can't put something in you that makes you unclean because it's already so dirty in there anyway. (laughs) To defile is to make unclean or impure. It's to be contaminated. And Jesus teaches that being clean is not about external things. It's not about what you do or that you don't do that determines your righteousness before God. For the religious types, and you might be sitting here saying, that's really hard, that's hard. I want a list. I want to know what it is. And for the irreligious type, you might be sitting here going in a, in a rather fooled way, ha, that means I get to do whatever I want. You see, we all kind of struggle with this. We all want the movie rating system. We, you know how movies are rated, right? There's, there's the, the rated R movies. Who goes to rated R movies? Nobody put your hand up. Because <laughs> we're good Christians at church, right? Or, 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 or there's PG movies, right? Who goes to PG movies? Everybody put your hand up. Everybody, come on, put your hand up. You're all good Christian people. You watch PG movies, Right? We want that kind of rating system in this whole thing. And the reality is, neither the person who says, I go to our movies and just flaunts it, or the person who's like, I never go to ours, I just go to PG's, and is proud about it, okay? Neither one of those people are trusting in grace the grace of Jesus Christ. All of us are struggling and we're all wearing masks trying to help people understand I'm a good person. I'm a, I, or sometimes we're proud about being a bad person. We're all wearing these masks to do that. And Jesus clarifies this and He teaches the twelve. Here, write this down. Number three this morning. Religion confuses the source of defilement resulting in trusting eternal righteousness rather than heart transformation. Because we don't know the source of defilement, because we think it's outside things, we think that we have to do things on the outside to clean up our act. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not how it goes. It's your heart that needs to be transformed. It's your heart that is, starts out defiled. And so he goes on and he explains it to the twelve in verse 17. And he says, then you are also without understanding. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? He's just talking about eating. You can eat things. And this is why then later in Acts 10, the sheet comes down and Peter sees that there's no unclean foods. And this is all referring to this right here, what Mark clarifies and says he, de- he declared all foods clean at that point. But, but don't get caught up on that. Look at verse 20. And what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts. And, and then the list goes on. It's what's on the inside that is unclean. 
And we have to realize that in the basis of our worldview, a Christian worldview, what Jesus teaches is that we don't all start out good. Actually, none of us start out good. We all start rotten from the inside. We know that we're rotten from the inside because when we read this list, we have to say guilty. There's nobody here that can read this list and say, I'm not guilty of any of these. Look at the list. Evil thoughts. Sexual immorality. That's any sort of sexual activity outside of God's created boundary of marriage. In thought, deed, emotion, whatever. Theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Notice in this list of 12 things, six of them are actions, they're activities, the first six, and then the last six are all attitudes. So actions that we could judge on the outside, we could figure that out if we look close enough at your life, but also attitudes, things on the inside that... Listen, only you would know, only you you and God would know and understand if there was something that you have done that is outside of God's commands here. And Jesus is pointing to the problem with religion, the problem with the tradition of the elders, the legalist. It's the heart that they fail to address. And so even though there are some people who say, we're Christian and we have a whole bunch of rules about how to be Christian, they're not actually representing God. And the fact that He cares far more for your heart than He cares about how you act. He wants to change the inside, the motivation, the power source, before He washes on the outside and cleans up all of that. And we get it opposite. And we do it all the other way. And that's why we wear masks. That's why we wear things to make people think that we're better than we are, right? So I brought some masks. Some people, I've got to figure out which one to use here. This isn't going to coincide with what I'm saying, but that's close enough. Some people wear the happy mask. <laughs> I'm just always happy. Everything's great. Going well, right? Some people... Where I'm better than most people mask. You go to your closet every day and you say, I'm better than most people, and you put that mask on. Some people say, I'm very together. And they put on the very together mask. Oh, I got my act together. It's always together. Oh, I always have my, I'm never late. I always bring food. It's always awesome. I got, it. I got it together, baby. Right? Or maybe, maybe I'm the victim of others' mask. It's what others have done to me. That's why I am the way I am. You see, we all have closets full of these masks. And, and, and we never leave the house without a few of them because we might need to change them along the way. I, I may, might need to be one of those and then I get into a different scenario and a different situation. I've got to put a different mask on for that particular audience, right? And we're all actually pretty good at this because at the core of it is self. We create some sort of system, some sort of religion, some sort of values that we live by. It's all to make it, to look like we're making it as we fake it. And Jesus is not impressed when we live like Pharisees and He wants to remove it. And He'll do whatever it takes. So I brought a story with me that you're going to just have to listen to. Listen to Jim and his testimony of how God removed the mask. One of the ways that God dealt with my masks is he put me in a jail cell for a season of time. 55 days to be exact. 
And while I was in there, I received this letter, and I want to read you a short paragraph from this letter that I received from my youth pastor that I grew up with. He said, Jim, I just got your address last night, and I woke up at 5 a.m. pondering what to say in this letter. You are my friend, and I'm committed to you. Even though I'm profoundly saddened by your unfaithfulness and your sin. I also know the depths of my own darkness and the battle to live honestly without guile. So I am not shocked by your fall. We are all vulnerable. And if we allow the secret parts of our life to grow and take over us, The partial truths you told and the secrets you kept prevented you from fully experiencing God's grace and transformation of your inner self. Now that your facade is falling and you're dealing more honestly with your brokenness in your life, the Spirit of God can work on the real gym deep down inside. And for me... To know of the fact that all my shame was betrayed, all my shame was exposed, all my failure was exposed. I was defiled and I was contaminated and I was dirty and I was sinful. And and God in Himself, you know, for for another brother or sister in Christ to see my defilement, to see all of that is so incredibly free. And so this whole hiding thing, God granted me his mercy and, and his grace. And he spoke to me during that season of time and said, deny yourself. Die to yourself. (laughs) And I remember one Friday night, it was actually September the 14th, laying in my cell on this lovely cement slab. Lonely, feeling betrayed, feeling forsaken. And the next day saying to God, I'm done. I quit. I surrender. I give up. And I remember hearing audibly from the Spirit of God that day. He said, finally you're dead. Now I can make you alive. You're empty, and now I can fill you. And now I can use you. Jesus might have brought you church to here today to bring you to a spot where you realize I'm not all the way dead. And I'm faking myself out thinking that I'm doing all sorts of good things that God accepts when he doesn't. And he's waiting for you to come to that place where you say, I'm done. I'm done with my way. And I'm ready for God's. So I urge you to remove the mask of religion through repentance. Repentance is something that we fight. I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. I don't want to admit that I'm contaminated. I don't want to admit that I'm defiled. I would hate myself to say it publicly, and you would hate me if I did too, is what we think. But one of the great theologians of old, his name is Thomas Watson, said this, Until sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Our hearts many times are not longing for God, so we fill them with fleeting pleasures. Just remind you, if you are actively sinning, You can't stop. 
you're stuck. But God is calling you to stop. And so your only hope comes from purity in the One who is actually pure. The only hope comes, as John says in this, but to all who receive Him, who believe in His name, He gave them the right to become children of God. I would remind you that what that verse says, it's nothing of your own effort. Willpower is no power. Repentance is what God is calling you to do. To change your mind and to move in a completely different direction. To admit, God, I've been trying to work my way to you. I've been a good religionist. I, I, I've been a good rule follower. I thought that was acceptable to you, but that's not true. I'm realizing here today. I would also have you know that repentance is not really an act of your will. I know that from my own life, I can't stop sinning even when I want to. I cannot feel contrite when I know it's the right thing to do. I can't be sorry. And it frustrates me. Repentance is not doing something about your sin. Rather, it's admitting that you can do nothing to be forgiven. And that God has to grant this to you. That's why the theme of our message today is that Jesus calls us to trust in His perfect work on our behalf. Not in our own external righteousness. Religion and rules are inadequate. And only the work of Jesus can save. That's the gospel message. That's what you have to put the full weight of your belief on. That's what you have to say, that's right, I was wrong, I repent. And in doing so, stop trusting in your ways. And let God break through and overwhelm you with His way. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. It is indeed sweet to us. And Lord, it confronts our way of thinking that is wrong. That somehow if we put on the mask and we follow the rules and we create the system that we benefit from, that You would be pleased. Forgive us, Lord. We recognize that is foolishness. That you want to rip out the heart of stone that has come up with these ideas and we want to do things your way. To fall on your mercy. Lord, you don't give us what we deserve. To receive the gift of grace. (laughs) Thank you for giving us what we don't deserve. Lord, would you help each individual here to trust you in this way. To learn this lesson in a way that doesn't just transform their life, but helps others be transformed as well. God, would you break through what we have thought and show us your way again, we pray.